Well, we started at 68, then we get to 64. From there, it is 32, and then the lucky ones who survive to the Sweet 16. The Elite Eight brings out the best, and we are packed and ready for Cleveland and the 2024 Final Four. But who's in? Who still has a shot? Let's dive in. It all starts right now here on Locked on Women's Basketball. Ogumba Wallet for the win. You are Locked On Women's Basketball, your daily podcast on women's basketball. Happy Monday, friends. It is April 1st, 2024. Spring is in the air. We've had opening day in Major League Baseball. They tell me I think that the Masters is coming up. (laughs) And oh, thank goodness, we still get at least one more week of college basketball. Hi, everybody. I am Missy Heydrich, National Correspondent at The Next. Thank you for making Locked on Women's Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You can follow me at Missy Heidrich, and then be sure to follow this podcast at Locked On WBB. Then you take yourself over to the next, www.thenexthoops.com, for all of the amazing coverage and content with my colleagues there at The Next. Well, there are no April Fool's jokes here, I promise. The 2024 NCAA tournament has yet again been a fantastic display of women's college basketball. As the game grows and grows to new heights with massive numbers and eyeballs that are watching and attending, we have two out of four that are set for the final four. Mm -hmm. Who will get the coveted last two spots here to help us break it all down? One of my amazing colleagues at the next a veteran of covering women's sports across the country and women's basketball. And she just so happens to be in Portland, site of two regionals. Hello, Michelle Smith. Good morning to you out there on the West Coast. All right, let's start first by talking about the games and the players and the matchups and the people that we saw first and foremost. We've got two teams that are into the Final Four, one of which you have seen with your eyes there in Portland. It has been quite a run for this NC State team who not only had to knock off the number two seed in Stanford in the Sweet 16, but then had to take down Texas yesterday to get themselves to the Final Four. Talk a little bit about what you've seen on the floor in Portland and what this NC State team brought that has made it to this magical run that's going to get them to to Cleveland. Yeah, so I'm not sure, you know, when, when, as we've talked about the names and the teams and the matchups and whatever, like I, NC State wasn't really on my radar in terms of getting a spot in Cleveland. Um, and I know I'm way out on the West Coast. And so we'll, <laughs> maybe I've got a little West Coast bias happening. I don't know. But um, NC State wasn't necessarily on my radar, but they've come in like a team that thinks that they belong here and played like a team that belongs here and they have outshot and out defended and out energied two of the you know the big dogs i mean they you know they came in and they beat stanford and texas in this region and to get themselves to cleveland and you know two teams with experienced bigs and you know cameron brink madison booker kiki often like you know, big name players. And, you know, I don't think the NC State players in this era of the marquee have those players whose names you see up on a marquee, but they just came in and they did it. I'm really impressed. I'm really impressed with Wes Moore. I'm really impressed with what they've done in this tournament. You know, they've shot the ball well. They've answered, you know, they've just, they've had an answer for everything. And so I think, you know, they're going to be the surprise team that shows up in Cleveland. Um, but good on them because yeah. they like they're because they've played like they belong in this group. Well, and it's ironic because their men's team also into the final four. They won yesterday. They have mm-hmm. been absolutely the Cinderella on that side of the house. Yeah. I don't know if this NC State team maybe has quote unquote Cinderella behind it and yeah. that sort of mojo. But it was a team at the very beginning of the season, back in October and November, where people were like, mm, nobody really knows because they, they were young. Right kids. to start the year. Yeah. yeah. And they were young and they were new faces. And it was kind of Westmore saying, got to be honest, I'm not 100% sure 
what we've got here and what we do. As the season went on, they beat people. They beat UConn mm -hmm. early. They kind of made a name for themselves. It just seems as though it's very workmanlike, kind of go about your business. And they didn't seem to shy away from a big stage. No. And they've got big wins in the, in the ACC. And, you know, it's just, it is, it's just one of those things where, and I, you know, for Westmore to say, I'm not sure what I've got is some good honesty there, right? Because there are some teams that want to wear that chip on their shoulder. Nobody thought we could dot, dot, dot. Right. And yeah. we get a lot of that this time of year, but you know, I think NC state can own that. I think that they, you know, I think that they could probably corner the market on nobody was, you know, Nobody thought we could. I mean, they started the year with they weren't ranked in the top 25. What were they picked in the ACC? Sixth, I think yeah. it was. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and we'll jump over to the other side to a team that was picked 10th in the Pac-12 who ended up going toe-to-toe -to -toe for a decent amount of the game with South Carolina. Like, there's sometimes, and I've written this, sometimes you don't know what a team has. It's getting harder with the transfer portal, with the chemistry, with the mix, with how's a team going to do when players haven't really played together yet. And you make a lot of educated guesses about what you think they're capable of. And in this case, you know, NC State was capable of a lot more. Well, as we said, they knock off Texas, the number one seed in the Portland Four Regional. They won by 10, 76 to 66. And now their matchup in the Final Four in Cleveland is out of that other regional, the Albany One Regional, mm -hmm. which saw South Carolina beat Indiana. It had Oregon State, who came out of the bottom of the bracket. They knock off the number two seed in Notre Dame. So we had South Carolina and Oregon State matching up in this Elite Eight game. And I, like you, have been just so quietly and yet thoroughly impressed with what Oregon State did really all season. And they flew under a lot of radars. So when we talk about NC State being under the radar, I think you got to say Oregon State flew under almost everybody's mm -hmm. just because of the season they had a year ago. They weren't picked high in those polls, but yet slowly and methodically, they knocked teams off. They had, a, I think, a 12 to 13 game winning streak at home. All of those things set them up to put them in the great position that they were. And they pushed South Carolina yesterday in that Elite Eight matchups. Your thoughts on that game and what you saw out of Oregon State? What I saw out of Oregon State is what I've seen for most of the season. It Everything runs through Reagan Beers, a really, really talented kid inside. They've got a really kind of a classic post. And she's really, really efficient. Um you know, but they've got Tamia Gardner and they've got um, Talia Von Olhoffen as their floor leader, who's a fourth year kid because she was one of those kids who came out in high school yep. um, during the COVID and came in. She graduated early and showed up in January of the COVID year to get started with her college career. So she's had this extra time with them to develop her, you know, develop that leadership and develop that trust among those players. But, you know, Oregon State was a team that was picked 10th in the Pac-12 with a lot of teams that were coming back with loaded rosters. And they, you know, and Scott Rook is a great coach. But, you know, their non-conference, they stayed close to home during non-conference. They didn't really have any key mark, key matchups. So when you talk about these teams, you don't know what to make of them yet, that their record might be great, that they it all looks good. Scott's got a way, you know, he wanted to build confidence in this team. And he didn't challenge them a ton in the non-conference compared to some of the other matchups that other people took on, but they just kept getting better and better and better through the season. And they're built. I, you know, going into coming out of the Pac-12 tournament, I said, this team's going to do some damage. Um, I don't know that I saw them. I don't know that I saw them knocking off Notre Dame. And yeah. I was really impressed with the way that they played South Carolina. South Carolina yes. pushed them away a little bit mm -hmm. and managed to stay out front. But for a long time, they went toe to toe with an, the unbeaten probably national championship favorite and it's been a really interesting weekend it and i would just add you know the conversations are about the future for this oregon state team mm -hmm. because you know you say they've got a lot coming back this is going to be a dangerous team into the future and to which i say i hope so yeah their move you know the dissolution of the pac-12 as we know it the you know oregon state washington state being left you know to stay in this pac-2 setup for a few years while they figure out next steps are they going to keep people? Um, I loved Talia Gardner's quote, which was the grass is greener if you water it. <laughs> um, Amen. This is true. It was a great, you know, and so I think that they're, you know, Scott Rogue's going to do his very best to talk to some of these kids about sticking around, but they're going to be in the West Coast Conference next year, which is the conference Gonzaga comes from. 
-hmm. I don't know. I mean, I hope, I hope he holds us together because this is a really good team. But I know that in the universe that we live in and with everything that's happened in the pack this year, that that is no guarantee. You are absolutely right. Well, they did push South Carolina, still the only undefeated team in all of college basketball, women's or men's. It was a 70 to 58 win. South Carolina advances. They match up now with NC State and Cleveland. There are still two more spots to go. We are going to talk about that and more when we come back. More on the matchups that have captivated us in Portland, what we're looking forward to. And oh, by the way, there are storylines coming out of that regional. We'll talk about it on the other side. But first, a message from our friends at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. March is over, but the biggest moments in college basketball tip off the month of April. Be part of the action on prize picks for both men's and women's college basketball. You can win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with a little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into a thousand with basketball, hockey, college basketball entries today on prize picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Prize picks also offers weekly promotions and special offers for the biggest moments in sports. It is now offers Apple Pay for quick and easy deposits into your account this basketball season. So download the app today and use the code LOCKEDONNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. That's download the app, use the code LOCKEDONNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Hi, everybody. I am Missy Heidrich, and welcome back. You are watching, are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Well, you have to turn down the volume with all that shouting. We'll make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Missy Heydrich here with Michelle Smith. She is in Portland, part and site of two of the regionals of this 2024 NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament. All right, Michelle, let's just talk first. Let's talk about some of the players that have stood out, especially from this NC State team. They advance to the Final Four. We know it has been a group. We we just talking about it, maybe kind of a little bit under the radar, not 100% sure what they have. But were there players that struck you and stood out to you over the course of these two games that really set themselves apart and gave this NC State a squad, an opportunity to get to the Final Four? Sanaya Rivers, obviously, right? Um, and she has played so well and she got them there to begin with, you know, she got them into the sweet 16 with the big performance in the, um, second round. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, they've got, you know, they've got shooters, they play great defense. They've got, you know, river Madison inside, they've got size inside, they've got players and mm -hmm. they've got inside out. Right. And so they've got these things, but you have to have good guard play at this point in the NCAA tournament. And, you know, and Rivers is, you know, and Rivers is that attention, that attention getting guard for them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the, their leading score in that game, Zaya James, 20, oh, yeah. 27 points. And she played all 40 minutes in that elite eight game. That's a heck of a performance by that young lady. Well, and let's talk about Isaiah James. I didn't mean to leave her out, but, you know, and what she did against Stanford, I mean, you know, she had a 25-point second half against Stanford when they were down and, you know, and then they came roaring back in that game and, you know, past Stanford going away. And James was, you know, hitting shots. And, yeah, I mean, Isaiah James has had, I think, a breakout tournament for sure. Well, and if you look at any of the box scores, I think of all of their games throughout the NCAA tournament. Yeah, there's been big score. It could have been James, as you said, with a big a big performance against Stanford. She has it again against Texas. But it's also balance on that stat sheet and balance mm -hmm. in the scoring column, balance in the rebounding column. They don't turn it over a lot. Like all of these things set up to be a, a really good, good team that I think can push and challenge anybody once you put them on a neutral court and you put them into a stage like the final four. 
Yeah, I'm going to be, though, I, I, I'm going to hedge and just say, though, that I think South Carolina is just playing with a head of steam. Yeah. And so, you know, and it's not what North Carolina State has been great till up till now, whatever, but I don't know. I, ju I just don't know if anybody's going to knock off South Carolina in this tournament at the rate, at the way that the way that they're playing with the toughness that they're playing, mm -hmm. they are getting pushed and they are responding and, you know, they're getting big shots from Raven Johnson and Kimla Cardoza is playing great. And Tahina Pow Pow is such a steady floor leader for them and whatever, but I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think that there's a lot of momentum with South Carolina right now. I absolutely agree. And they, to me, I, I, it goes with the idea that if you want to be the best, you've got to beat the best. And right now, nobody has found the formula to knock off South Carolina. They haven't done it. As we said, they've been pushed. They've had people kind of put their backs against the wall and they have responded. And I'll point out from freshman Tessa Johnson, 15 points in 21 minutes off the bench yesterday in their yeah. win over yeah. Oregon State. That just talks about depth. No one, yeah. I think, has the depth that South Carolina has left in this tournament. Yeah, and depth is a big deal when you've played this grind. For When you're on the third weekend of this grind, you need depth. You need to be able to bring somebody on, off the bench and have them do what it is that you need them to do. Absolutely. All right. We can't talk about Portland apparently without a little bit of drama and a little bit of craziness Ooh. that has happened. Um, for everyone that maybe didn't get the full download, there has been a controversy and a whole thing. It was realized prior to the game starting yesterday that there were some lines on the court that weren't even an equal. Can you give us the Cliff Nose version and what happened and what will happen? Because there's still another game to be played there today. Yes, there is. And it's a big <laughs> one. And it's a, and it's a significant one. Um so apparently, according to reports, a fan in the stands what had an upper view, a higher view of the court, um, and noticed that the three-point arcs were not equal, that the distance, that the distance between the key and the three-point arcs on both at either end of the court were not the same. Sent a message through a friend, literally like had a friend who was a walking down into the tunnel said, hey, you want to let them know this, tell somebody with tournament, somebody gave the referees a heads up. And then it begins with the images that we've seen of, you know, Wes Moore and, and Vic Schaefer literally walking with their shoes, trying to measure it off. Um, Women's Committee Tournament Chair, Lisa Peterson, who's been there, standing there with a guy with a measuring tape, like it was, and they're not, and they're wrong. And those, and, and that court is not symmetrical and, you know, and we've played three games on there before we get to, to the point yeah. where we determine that these three point lines are not symmetrical. So the NCAA has issued a statement and um, they have, you know, they have placed the responsibility on the floor, the manufacturer of the floor, and they have said it will be fixed by today. So I thought what was interesting and disappointing yesterday was that the coaches agreed to play on the court as it was mm -hmm. um, based on the fact that it would take about an hour to repair and they were going to lose their ABC broadcast window. Yeah. And I, and I just wish that wasn't a choice they had to make Yeah, and under those circumstances, right? We could, everybody could have waited an hour for them to get it right. Mm -hmm. But you know, this idea of losing the television broadcast window and the importance of that, like I just, I don't know. I'm disappointed that they had to be put in that position to make a choice because I wouldn't have minded seeing them try and fix it on the spot, but I don't know what that would have taken, by the way. I don't want to say that I understand what right. it would have been. And maybe a taped off floor would have been more confusing for their players. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it was just, you were going to roll with what it was, but they have said it's going to be ready today. So, um, you know, and they have just a small matchup that not a lot of people might watch today with, UConn and USC and Paige and Juju and you know so they're gonna fix it yeah well <laughs> but, that's good but what a but what a what a mess and yeah. I and it's comes on a you know and it comes on a after a tournament of what happened with Utah last week mm -hmm. in Spokane and Coeur d'Alene and the incident that they endured with the racist haunting and uh you know Hannah Hidalgo in the nose ring and Honestly, some officiating that I think has been pretty inconsistent. There have been, you know, 
there have been a lot of the game's best players sitting on the bench in foul trouble in this tournament over the last couple of weekends. And that's not to say those kids don't deserve, you know, that fouls aren't called, but I don't know. The whole thing in, in total mm -hmm. just doesn't do honor and justice to what the players are putting on the floor in this tournament. 100% agree with you. And I would also add to that list, go back all the way. Gabriella Lewis and I talked about this last week of a official having to be removed yes. at halftime. Mm -hmm. And that was actually in an, N an NC State game, I believe, yes. because the official had, um, they had not done the complete conflict checks. There was a conflict with Chattanooga. They switched out an official at halftime. Mm -hmm. if that's not something that you know ahead of time, then we got a lot of problems. So mm -hmm. I agree with you. There's a list. And some may say this isn't a real big one. It's not a lot of major scenarios. But when you're talking about not lines not correct on a floor that has right. been manufactured specifically for this, mm -hmm. we've got issues with officials on who can be and who cannot. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about a social injustice problem that we know is rampant, but yet no occurred and wasn't thought about in advance, I think we have to start to look a little bit more internally if I'm the NCAA and I'm looking at this and say, you know what, the buck stops somewhere and I need somebody to answer for some of this. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, um, I don't want to be, we don't want to be talking about this and any yeah. more frankly than I, we, I think we wanted to be talking about news articles and right. things that, you know, and the stuff that happened with LSU and Washington post and Los Angeles times. And like, I don't want to be talking about this. No, me either. I don't want to be talking about what is happening on that floor. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to be talking about, you know, I want to be not talking about three point lines today. I want to be talking about Juju and page Amen. and their team and their teams. Yes. Make no mistake. And they're <laughs> incredibly good teams. Well, when we come back, that is what we are going to do because we've got two spots left in the final four in Cleveland, Albany two, Portland three regional finals. They are tonight. We're going to talk about it with Michelle in just a moment. Well, Fire TV is your destination for sports, from live games to highlights to in-depth. The Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV it provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. That includes all of us at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive into all of the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep you up to date on the latest in the world of sports. March Madness, NBA, MLB, and lots more, not to mention Great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos, everything. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you don't, if you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, well, you absolutely should. Trust me on this. To learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. Hi, everybody. Missy Heydrich, thank you for joining us here on Locked on Women's Basketball. Michelle Smith has so graciously joined us from Portland, where she is there. And we'll see the second of the two regional finals that we have on board tonight. And yes, that is not an April Fool's jokes, folks. We are going to get two more teams in the Final Four tonight. Now, let's start on the East Coast, because that's the first one. 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. on the East Coast. We are going to get the number one seed in the Iowa Hawkeyes against the number three seed and the LSU Tigers. This is a rematch of what we saw in the Final Four last year. They get it in the Elite Eight instead this season. And yes, this has been about Caitlin Clark and the balance and who is on her roster. Mm -hmm. And we are going to see a lot of sparkle and we are going to see a lot on the floor and off from this matchup. Your thoughts on what Albany, what, uh, the Albany two regional Elite Eight game is absolutely going to bring to our eyeballs. Oh, so much fun. <laughs> I mean, so much juice, right? So much. I'm so excited about this game. I'm so excited about both these games today yep. for the women's game. And I know there's people that say, I wish this was in the final four, but 
you know, let's not just, let's not leave South Carolina out of this conversation. Let's not leave NC State out. They've earned their tickets. Let's just appreciate today for what it's going to be, which is going to be so much fun. Um, but, you know, I, this, I think this is going to be a knockdown drag out. And I don't mean that in the, you know, sense that anybody's going to be knocking down and dragging out, right. you know, but I think this is, I think these are two teams. I, you know, I think obviously, you know, th- Everybody wants to see Clark go as far as she can. Yep. They want, you know, I think there's a lot of people who want to see, you know, Iowa back in the final four and, you know, for better and worse, you know, LSU always manages to be cast in the villain role. Um, and, but they're such a good basketball team. Right. And, you know, and, you know, they beat a really good UCLA team that had, you know, veteran players and great guards and Lauren Betts inside. and. And LSU won that game because they're really, really good. Yes. And so I think this is going to be, um, I hope it's a game that is not marred by the whistles. Mm-hmm. I hope people get to play. Yes. I hope, um, you know, I hope that Kim's outfit, you know, blinds me just a little, <laughs> um, I, you know, but it's just like, I just want to watch this game. Like, yeah. I just want to, as a spectator, you just want to see like, I mean, the X's and O's wise, I think these are just two really evenly matched teams. And I don't know who's going to win this game. No, I'm exactly, I'm with you. I think they're, if you could have asked for a better one, three matchup, I think this is it because they are incredibly even. I think it's going to be very physical. It's going to be played Mm -hmm. in the full court. So get Mm -hmm. ready to get your track shoes on because both of these teams are going to get up and down and they've got to take advantage. They've got to get out in transition because you're not going to get a lot of opportunities in the half court just simply because I think LSU is very good defensively. They can turn it on when they want. And yet Iowa has the ability to execute and they'll run you off screens and they'll keep you moving and they will frustrate you. So I think both of these teams are saying, you know what, let's get out and go and let's make our lives a little bit easier. See if you can't capitalize. But please, oh, please, oh, please to the basketball gods. You know, I I know the officials are probably going to want to feel like they need to control the emotions in this game because I think there's a lot to that. Right. But it will be so disheartening to see people sitting with quick fouls and things. I mean, I I don't want to see people getting hurt. I'm not I'm not there to watch football. Right. Like, that's not what we're talking about. But I'm just I there is a little part of me that's a little bit worried about how the officiating is going to go in this game. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely, I think that's one thing to keep your eye on, especially early. I think how the whistle is maybe in the first five to six minutes could tell us a lot. And then maybe depending on where it is, if it's close coming out of halftime, they may tighten things up even then. Those are the two instances where I think officials make those adjustments or changes, good or bad. It usually seems to happen then. All right, right, let's move out to the West Coast where you are at, the game that you are going to see. Um, nine o'clock Central Time. That is uh, where, excuse me, nine o'clock on the East Coast, eight there o'clock on the Central for me. That's where I am in the middle of America. And I get to watch another one three matchup, which is USC and UConn. And yes, this is Juju and this is Paige. But as you said just a few moments ago, these are two teams full of talent, top to bottom. They are. And, you know, they're built differently, you know. So let's start with UConn. UConn is still playing very shorthanded. I mean, the number of kids that are sitting on that UConn bench in street clothes just lined up is just, it's alarming. (laughs) It really is. Um, but, you know, they've got – so, you know, Aaliyah Edwards got in foul trouble in that game against Duke but came out with four – you know, came in with four fouls late in the game and had a big jumper and had a big re- a defensive rebound that nailed down that game for them when Duke came charging back. They need her on the floor. Yeah. And she knows they need her on the floor. Yeah. Um, Paige, you know, it was interesting yesterday to talk about – with Gino about Paige's hunger to get to a national championship – with everything she's been through in her career, mm-hmm. you know, she doesn't have the hardware that Stewie and Diana and Maya and those players have, yeah. despite the fact that I think that people think that she's every bit as talented as some of the best players that have ever come through UConn. And he said, she's really hard to gauge. And when you, we asked her about her hunger, she's really hard to gauge. <laughs> like you just know there's an internal motor uh-huh. and she is capable of willing UConn and, and, Nika Mule and, and Aaliyah Edwards and 
KK Arnold, at, like the team, the players they have on the floor, but they're going to be dealing with a very big USC team, mm-hmm. big at every position. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Juju Watkins as a freshman has come in and she's had a, a tremendous tournament. Mackenzie Forbes is averaging 23 points a game during the tournament. They've got, you know, you've got a double double possibility every game with Ray Marshall. Like these are, you know, they have a little more depth than UConn yeah. does. I just wonder at what point in this tournament does UConn's lack of depth start to wear on them and can Beckers will them through that? Yeah, I think that's the number one question. You're absolutely right. Foul trouble being a big piece of that because they don't have a plethora of people to go to. Or even if Beckers gets in foul trouble, let's say she picks up too quick. That changes the landscape for them. Whereas for USC, Lindsay Gottlieb's got a lot more options that she can use and triage. You can use people for two or three minutes, get them in, get them out. Gino doesn't have that luxury right now for UConn, and this could very well be that type of matchup that causes them a host of problems. Yeah, he's got eight players, and he's using six more. You know, he's using six a lot. Yeah. Um, And, you know, so Gottlieb will have more depth than that. But I did, you know, I want to shout out to Lindsay Gottlieb, who I've known for a long time. I've known since she coached at UC Santa Barbara, and then when she came over to Cal and her years at Cal. But, you know, I think that reviving women's basketball in Los Angeles is a huge thing for the women's yeah. game. Yeah. I think it's, you know, bringing, and it's, and Corey, and to some degree with Corey and UCLA, and I don't want to, you know, and discount what's happened at UCLA, but bat, women's basketball is back in LA. And, you know, for her to embrace, for Lindsay to say to Cheryl Miller and Tina Thompson, those players, that the door is always open for you and that we want people to know what you did through what we're doing mm-hmm. and rebuilding that USC women's basketball history and making it a place where, you know, in a show business town, it's pretty damn entertaining. Yeah. I mean, but I just think that rebuilding women's basketball in Los Angeles is going to be huge for women's basketball. And I want to give a lot of credit to Lindsay Gottlieb for laying that foundation because I, you know, it's, It's exciting. And it's exciting to see, you know, and we know that Gottlieb is a player's coach. She always has been. Mm -hmm. Um, She's a player who wants to talk. There's not a lot of bombast. It's not about her. Mm -hmm. Um, She's such a thoughtful human, um, just in general. But a lot of credit to Lindsay Gottlieb for what she's done at USC. Well, and she kept... Juju Watkins at home. I mean, that's a homegrown kid from the Los Angeles area area that said, you know what, this is where I want to be. This is what I want to do. And now they have a chance to get back to the biggest stage and the final four if they can beat UConn today. And as you said, couldn't be better for the, for LA to be a women's basketball destination yet again and kind of fun to have rivalries. UCLA and USC being a women's mm-hmm. basketball rivalry again, it's not a bad thing whatsoever for anybody no, involved. It is not. And it gets the LA media market engaged. And there's just a million reasons why it's good. I think it's good for the Sparks. I think yes. it's good for the W. I think to have the LA media market engaged in women's basketball when they haven't been to the degree that we wish they were for a long time is huge. Yeah. And, you know, Juju Watkins gets a lot of credit for that, but Lindsay got her there. Lindsay built this team that's one game away from going to a final four. And, you know, it's a ton of credit for me. No doubt about it. All right. That is nine o'clock on the East coast, eight o'clock in the central time zone, six o'clock where Michelle is. She will be on site for USC and UConn, the one versus the three seed. I'm not going to ask you for a projection. I'm not going to have you try to predict this game because I think both of these ones we're going to see tonight are too hard to predict. But I want everybody to know where are they going to find Michelle as she goes through the rest of today and into tonight? You're going to find me at the next and you're going to find me on Twitter at MaxSmith413. Twitter X, what do we call it? So you're going to find me, <clears throat> you're going to find me there and you're going to find me courtside, which I'm so excited for. I love those courtside seats, <clears throat> the things you get to see and hear, and you just got to keep your head up in case, you know, basketball player comes flying at you, but um, it's all going to be so good. And I don't want to predict it. I just want to enjoy it. I just want to absorb it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where we are at tonight. We've got two spots, everybody. Two are into Cleveland. They've punched their tickets, South Carolina and NC State. Two more tonight, and that will be the Iowa-LSU matchup first, and then USC and UConn. 
Thank you, everybody, for joining us here on Locked on Women's Basketball. Come back all this week. More setup as we head to the Final Four and all of the news in college basketball and on the international front and in the WNBA because that is right around the corner. We've got you covered at the next. That's where you find Michelle and all of my other amazing colleagues. Well, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, and now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of this Elite Eight. We will see you down the road. Cleveland is right around the corner. Have a fantastic week.